In the years around 1580, in the city of Florence, Italy, in the home of Giovanni de Bardi, Count of Vernio, a group of people came together to solve a common problem. They called themselves the Florentine Camerata. And their mission was to reform modern music. They wanted to change what Vincenzo Galilei, father of Galileo, called the corrupt and incomprehensible contemporary music, according to Wikipedia at one point in time. It sounded like this. Cue the Palestrina. <laughs> the style of music that you're about to hear any minute now is called polyphony. And it has four to six voices, each of which are equally important. And they all weave together to create music that is maximally beautiful. doesn't sound very corrupt to me, but it is kind of incomprehensible. And the camarada dared to ask the revolutionary question, what if we could understand the words? Specifically, they wanted to find an optimum balance between words and music to convey a story, to convey feeling, something other than the standard church hymns that everyone already knew the words to. And the camarada interests me because it reminds me of an agile team. See how many parallels you can find. First of all, it was composed of a diverse set of skills. So it's assembled in the home of a nobleman and there's other noblemen and merchants and clergy, but there's musicians and poets and philosophers and astronomers, what we would call scientists today, uh, lots of different people were in this conversation. They had sponsorship. Uh, Giovanni de Bardi was one of the major sponsors. They also met in the home of Jacobo Corsi and various other meetups in Florence. The same people talked to each other on a regular basis. They had a common goal, a common purpose, and they even had some shared methodology. They wanted, their strategy was to revive the practices of the ancient Greeks with the balance of combination of words and music. Now, there's some question as to how, how sincere they were in this because it's not like they had recordings. They don't actually know what the ancient Greeks did, but, but back then they thought history moved in circles instead of a, a line of progress. And so this lent legitimacy to their work, kind of like when we reference computer science papers from the 1970s. So the Camerata um, was successful. They, they worked really well. Caccini, one of, the, one of the members, remarked, I learned more from their learned discussions than in 30 years of descant. At descant, I had to look that one up. It means lecturing to what you're getting now. Fortunately, we have the rest of the conference for learned discussion. The, uh, the son of Giovanni de Bardi remarked, it's weird, it's like these men that get together every other week and, and they, nobody gambles and nobody drinks. They just talk to each other. So this was a little unusual, but it was productive. It also functioned as a workshop, so they didn't just talk. They also played music and experimented with music to see what the results were. They didn't all get along. There was rivalry between the two chief sponsors. So Barty, he just mostly wanted to talk. And Corsi just mostly wanted to play music. But these two things balance. 
And, and then within the Camerata, you've got Perry and Caccini, the, the two famous singers. And Perry is like, it's about the words with some music. And Caccini is like, it's about the music with some words. But these also balance, and, and they came together. They did code review. I find it interesting that in this, in this code review, um, the, the people were assigned to criticize or to defend. It's not just that one asshole who doesn't like you and takes it out on your code. There's structure here. In the end, uh, the Florentine Camerata did make history. They invented the stile representativo, also known as monody. The revolutionary, and it was at the time, the revolutionary idea of maybe one melody with some light musical accompaniment. So here's a sample from uh, Monteverdi, one of the first operas that we still have. <laughs> Now, I can't understand the words, but that's because I don't speak Italian. And I also hear that if I did speak Italian, it wouldn't help either because it's ancient Italian. It's like way older than Shakespearean English, like singing Chaucer or something. But back in the day, they could understand the words. And opera was wildly popular, and it told lots and lots of interesting stories. And it had a big impact. But what interests me most about the Camerata is the impact each person had after that work. So the Camerata met until at least 1583, but these were all published around 1600 or later. And uh, these are several of the publications of members of the Camerata as listed in Wikipedia. So the, and, and there's like a dozen Camerata members who have Wikipedia articles today. I mean, what are the chances if you live in like the year 1600? I bet they did not expect this. These aren't just operas either. There's also poetry. There's scientific treatises and philosophical. What I find really interesting is that the Camerata didn't just make something great. They didn't just invent something. They invented each other. The members of the Camerata became great themselves. This is a pattern you can see elsewhere. In my research on the Camerata, uh, the quotes in this presentation, unless otherwise attributed, are all from this paper, Collective Problem Solving, the Case of the Camerata, which I found in the Journal of the History of Ideas. And Dr. Ruth Katz talks about how this kind of problem solving that the Camerata did that built each person up uh, resembles the kind of invisible college that you see all over the place in science. And in science, this is like, it, it's people and the people that they write to and the people that work down the hall from them and that where the ideas interchange. So you've got like Newton and Leibniz and their contemporaries exchanging letters. Um, you've got, oh, I learned from a biography of, Jay, of Grace Hopper that like John von Neumann, when he came to the U.S. and when he came to, went to Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, along with him, there were several people, but some of the, a couple of those were people he went to high school with back in Hungary. And they studied mathematics along with him. And, I mean, what are the chances, if you go to high school in Hungary, that you end up in Los Alamos National Laboratory? They formed a group that built each other up. Invisible colleges have the properties. Uh, these are just the ones Dr. Katz lists of uh, a common understanding of research methods. So some sort of explicit or implicit methodology that is shared. Uh, priority problems, that means fighting over who is first. More on that later. And shorthand communication, like there's some common ground of understanding uh, that helps them communicate with each other. An example of this is the, the Club of Honest Whigs, which is a group that met in like the 1760s at the, the London Coffee House. I particularly enjoy this one um, because there's a good book about it. And uh, here, Joseph Priestley, who's known for the invention of oxygen, but more interestingly, he invented um, or discovered um, 
So he put a mouse in a jar and it dies. He puts a plant in a jar and it dies. He puts a mouse and a plant in a jar and they don't die so soon. (laughs) So he discovered that the oxygen carbon dioxide cycle, which people didn't appreciate until like the 1920s when ecosystems became a thing. Oh, and as a bonus, he discovered carbonation in beverages. So the interesting thing about Priestley is that he worked really closely with this club of honest wigs. They got together fortnightly to dine and discuss electricity. They were all electricians with Benjamin Franklin and a bunch of other people. Um, And this was a very fertile period for all of them. And of course, we know Ben Franklin and Joseph Priestley, but but also uh, Priestley and Price and Canton were involved not just in revolutions in biology and chemistry, but also religion and politics. These things all intertwined for them. And, oh, oh, another interesting thing about, it's important that it was at the London Coffee House because this is like in the Enlightenment. And, and, and it turns out that one of the reasons the Enlightenment was like such a period of discovery is that, that they recently started importing coffee and coffee became the drink that people had with breakfast. So they stopped drinking beer with breakfast every day, and suddenly everyone got smarter. <laughs> every, every discipline was new again, and whole new disciplines emerged, especially when they worked together. Of course, this, this also happens in art, this exchange of ideas. Uh, I got to go this spring, I got to go to Paris, and I went up the hill of Montmartre, and, and I took a picture of, this is one of the, the salons where the artists get together and exchange ideas. This one's called, in French, the Agile Bunny. And, and critics and artists and dealers, not just artists, but everyone involved in like the business domain of art, came together and talked up with each other. You can, you can see each like artistic style as a uh, problem solved. For instance, the Impressionists were about, how do I paint not what is, but what I see? And their interchange of ideas led them to all kinds of uh, new and interesting art. This is one of the houses in Montmartre, and these are uh, some of the famous artists and poets that lived there, most of them at the same time. This is not a coincidence how many of these people became famous. They worked together. Uh, Van Gogh, for instance, this is a painting that he did in the Netherlands when when he learned to paint. And then his brother Theo was in Paris and Theo was like, Vincent, you must come here. You have no idea what colors these people are using. So Vincent goes to Paris and his paintings indeed get a lot more colorful. I like that much better. This happened because he formed a circle of friends. And uh, Toulouse, Lautrec, and Gauguin, for instance, uh, their paintings wind up in the salon of Gertrude Stein 20, 30 years later. Uh, She and her brother were Americans, but they came to Paris and they collected art and artists because they had money, so they fed a lot of artists. And also poets and philosophers and, oh, Alfred Whitehead was a mathematician. And these people all hung out and exchanged ideas, like on a regular basis. She introduces Picasso to Matisse. They don't get along, but their rivalry is productive. Later, Picasso makes money and he runs his own salon and all kinds of photographers and writers and philosophers hang out with him. Uh, One of the other artists that uh, hung out with Picasso and then went back home to Kiev, uh, Alexandra Exter. I really like her stuff. And she went back to Kiev, and Alex, these other Alexanders are people she went to high school with and then influenced. And uh, Bogomazov in particular, he painted this, it's called Head. And I've got this print on the wall in my bedroom today. So this influence and these ideas, they, they flow among people. Of course, this happens in software. I can I spot these cameradas, at least in the past, by, by running into people at conferences who are speaking, and 
they like, they have these clusters in their history. For instance, ThoughtWorks London, around 2003, 2006, uh, these people all worked for ThoughtWorks, but not at the same client, but they found similar problems. So they, they came together to solve the problem of how do we deliver our software to production in less than two weeks and without gouging our eyes out? Uh, and then continuous integration and continuous delivery came out of this. They solved the problem of um, how do we change the trade-off between delivering often and delivering safety, safely, and discovered that if you automate delivery, you get both of those, and they're not in opposition anymore. But interestingly, uh, there's a bunch of books written by these people. Jez, for instance, wrote several books on continuous delivery, but other people in that group went on to do completely other things. So Dan North invented behavior-driven design. Nat T Price has some stuff on unit testing. Sam Newman is the prophet of microservices these days. Uh, and, but they all, like, stewed in this camarada that was ThoughtWorks London around that time. Uh, the original spring team also, well, in London, but distributed around the same time. Uh, these people came together and solved the problem of how do we program enterprise Java without hating life and without writing a ridiculous amount of code to do almost nothing. Um, so Rod invented the Spring Framework, and he's my CEO now, and Christian is my VP. But there's all of these other people who are also CEOs and founders and venture capitalists. And, and I run into people at conferences, oh, the other day I was at QCon London, and I'm looking at, oh, who's the keynote? Rob Harris, who's that? And Rod and Christian are like, oh, we know him, he's another Spring person. These groups form people. We build the, the greatness in ourselves within a great team. You want to think that you can hire a bunch of great people and poof, get a great team. It's the other way around. Great teams make great people. So why? Why is it that great teams make great people? I have a theory for you, a model that explains this and also some of the other uh, peculiarities of software development that I've noticed. It starts with Gregory Bateson. Now, Gregory Bateson, oh, his father, by the way, was William Bateson. And William Bateson was a biologist who coined the term genetics. And back in like the uh, 1900 to 1910, uh, he ran a lab that's like reproducing the results of Mendel because Mendel did this work first, but he didn't have a camarada to spread it, so it sat for a while. Uh, Gregory Bateson didn't do this alone, of course. He had a bunch of women, in fact. His wife and a bunch of other women worked in his lab with him because the men wouldn't do it because it wasn't real biology. It's real biology now. <laughs> yeah, so William Bateson, genetics. Uh, Gregory Bateson worked in cybernetics, uh, systems thinking. He was an anthropologist, among other things, and he brought systems thinking into social and behavioral sciences. One of his camaradas was the Macy Cybernetics Conferences. They met like 10 times over eight years. Um, he had other ones, but he was big in promoting systems thinking, which is very important in giving us new ways to think about the world today. Uh, back in the Camarada's day, they had the scientific method was just starting to emerge. Uh, these days, we have systems thinking. Another of Gregory Bateson's contributions is his daughter, Nora. And she takes systems thinking farther because she says, this word systems, we think about it mechanically. We think about it in terms of parts and relationships. Systems thinking is, is the progress of thinking about the relationships, but it's more than that. In the 60s, they tried to model entire ecosystem by sending hundreds of grad students out into the field for years and years to count blades of grass and insects and measure what was going on, and they thought if they just had enough numbers and enough formulas in the computer that they could predict changes in the ecosystem. But they're wrong, 
because it's not just the parts and the relationships. Each of those components of the ecosystem is evolving. It's learning and changing in reaction to all of the other parts all the time. And Nora says, we need a new word for that, something that doesn't evoke mechanicity. So she came up with the word symathesy from the Latin sim together and mathesy learning. And a symathesy is a learning system, an adaptive system, made of learning parts. This is what our team is like. At least with Agile, with the Agile movement, a big part of that is recognizing that it's not just who is on the team. It's also the relationships between us. But it's more than that. Because every day we learn from each other. Every day we come to work, we are different. And we know something we didn't know before. And we get that largely from our interrelationships with each other, with, our, with the exchange of ideas in our camarada. So we know that a system is not the sum of its parts. That would be an aggregate. Rather, it's a product of all their interactions. But further than that, when you look at a living system, a symathesy, it's also that the parts are a product of their past interactions. This is extremely powerful. There are very few zero-sum games in a symathesy and a lot of feedback loops that take us to whole new places. In our teams, our teams are symathesies, but I think in software, we have something more. We are even more of a symathesy than the camarada was or the artists in Montmartre because there's more to our team than us. If you define a team as everyone required for you to be successful, and you define success as a software developer, as having an impact on the world of my customers by operating useful software in production, then in order to have that impact, yes, I need a bunch of people, some of which are near me in the organizational chart, but I also need the running software itself. I need it to be running. That software is on my team. And I learn from it. I learn when it throws exceptions. I learn from the data it collects that tells me whether it's actually impacting the lives of my customers. And of course it learns from me because I change it. And also on my team are all the tools that I use to change that software, because I can't do it directly, to make sure it's running, to get it running more smoothly, to, and to learn from it, to get the information back out. It's important that the tooling is part of my symathesy. And in order for the tooling to be in the symathesy, I have to learn from it, which I definitely do, that's why it's there, and it has to learn from me. I have to be able to change it. So for instance, if for log aggregation I have Humio or Splunk, then I can write queries into that. And I can change how I see the log aggregation. And then I'm going to add log statements. Maybe I implement Honeycomb and I get observability on the fly. And then I'll start injecting events into my software so that it can tell me how it's working so that I can learn from it better. Of course, there's our deployment systems and our source control and our, our code editors, our IDEs, and there's our automated tests are all part of these tools that are part of our symathesy that we change in order to uh, keep that software running smoothly and to keep it useful in a world that is continually changing where standards are increasing. Um, and now this includes like the hardware that that software is running on. But I don't understand hardware. <laughs> One person cannot know everything. But uh, if I run Kubernetes, or actually if I pay Google to run Kubernetes, then I can use the API to teach Kubernetes what I want it to do. Keep three of these pods running at all times. And I can see from Kubernetes, I can learn from its API which ones are crash looping and which ones are running. I'm not going to install Linux, but I will build a Docker container. So it's important to have tooling that we can teach so that it can participate in our symathesy. That's why DevOps is crucial. 
We need some level of control while still not having to understand everything. So this model explains a couple things, along with why the teams are important. It says, um, it says why we, it helps to bring our whole selves to work. Because if we're going to participate in a living system, we need to be alive in it. It also begins to explain why software is so hard. Because all of these relationships are very complicated. I, it, I didn't always see it this way. I didn't always see it as so complex. Back in the day when I was just starting as a junior developer, it was me and my program that I was assigned to, and I made the changes that were requested by other people. And if I needed some data, I said, how do I use the database? These days I say, oh, I need some data. Which database shall I use? Or databases, and how am I going to stand those up and keep them up and migrate data to and from them? It's a lot more complicated. And, and this to me expresses, it expresses what is a senior developer? A senior developer has this broader perspective. They see the whole system that the team works on and all of the social half of the semaphasy as well. And they maintain relationships with more people and with more tools. And then when you go further along the individual contributor track, you're getting into architect and stuff like that. It looks like this. And you're seeing uh, more teams and more of their software. And so you're looking at the system and impacting the system at a higher level. If you go engineering management, turn this inside out, and you're focusing on the social halves of these semaphases. Uh, Charity Majors has a beautiful blog post about how if you can be good at both and like switch between individual contributor and manager every three to five years and learn from each side, then you have an incredible power because you have a lot of influence over the entire system. There are other things that make this hard and they're a little counterintuitive and therefore useful. Uh, one thing that's important is that this team, one of its challenges is it can't just look down and see its software running and manipulate it. Until Tron is a thing, we don't get to directly manipulate our software or our tools. We're separated by this line of representation between our world and all that digital runningness going on inside computers. We're limited to screens, to command lines, keyboards. So at the crudest level, we have SSH, but I hope I don't have to use that because it also lets me do a lot of things I don't want to do. But we have our, our log interfaces, and we have our deployment systems UI, and we have our Slack integrations, and we have GitHub, and we have our code editors, because code is one of the major ways that we both predict what our software will do and change what it will do. And all these things are, are really crucial because, and if you think about this, you can realize how important it is to have good tooling because that is our only means of communications, of visibility and control of our running software. Oh, I also like this diagram. I see the diagram again, please. Thank you. I also like this diagram because it lets me explain what I do in a few words, um, at Atomist, we're working on giving developers uh, more support in moving work from above the line to below the line. In a way that still, when you need to make a decision, it contacts a human, and in a way that scales up from helping me to helping my team to helping the organization. So that's pretty cool. The other thing that makes this really hard um, include, especially with this line of representation barrier, is that when we work with the code, when we think about and we plan what we're going to do, we're not working with the system directly. We're working with our mental model of the system. And these mental models are incredibly valuable and incredibly hard to acquire. Woods's law says that your mental model is always incomplete and out of date and Everyone else's mental model is also incomplete and out of date in different ways. Now, this is actually important because the system is sufficiently complex, by the time it gets interesting, uh, that one person can't hold the whole thing. If nothing else, I, I get 
I get tired sometimes of, I go to conferences or I listen to podcasts and it's always, you need to understand security and build it in from the beginning. You need to understand accessibility and build it in from the beginning. Code quality, testing, everything needs to be in there from the start and I need to understand all about all of it. It doesn't fit in my head. No, it doesn't. There's a limit to the amount one person can have in their heads. And so the trick is, is having a whole team. So yes, everyone's mental model needs to overlap and we need to have that common ground of communication and establishing that is expensive. That's the coherence penalty of adding a new team member. But we also need to not have duplication all over the place in our mental models because we collectively model something larger than we could individually. And we can think about it and we can come at it from are different perspectives, every one of which is important, like in the camerata. Mob programming, by the way, where you get together as a whole team and like five people work with one computer and the person typing is the only one who does not contribute to the decisions. And then you take turns with that so that every decision is voiced. That both establishes a common mental model faster than anything else and gets the knowledge from everyone. So when the limitation of in what we can accomplish is after a while it stops being what we can do and the limitation is what we can know and that's when this teamwork and communication is absolutely crucial pair programming helps a lot too it's kind of a degenerate mob programming because um, conveying these mental models is a big deal and it's harder than you think because you don't know how much you know. So it's really hard to transfer these models to other people when we don't remember acquiring them because we did it in the course of our work. Here's another law. This one is by Valentino Breitenberg who wrote, uh, he's a philosopher in the 60s. And he wrote a beautiful book called Vehicles which is very small and I highly recommend it. One of the major points he makes is the law of downhill invention uphill analysis, which says that it is easier to build a complex system from scratch, building up your mental model of it as you go, and then you understand how it works and you can manipulate it safely. That's easier than coming to an existing software system and figuring it out, figuring out how it works. It's counterintuitive, but it's totally true. As evidence, I present all the thousands of JavaScript frameworks that exist. <laughs> because the fact is that it's easier to build your own JavaScript framework to do exactly what you need it to do and then add complexity and add the complications that you need over time. That's easier than learning React. I really like getting a good grasp on React in spite of the thousands of people who've contributed to either the code or the documentation or answering questions on Stack Overflow. All of that work can't make it easier to uh, understand and adopt an existing system. Now, it's less work to use React and it's a lot more effective, but it's easier to feel productive coding away at your own JavaScript framework that you then understand and you have no idea why somebody else doesn't get it because it's completely intuitive and obvious. If you ever hear yourself saying intuitive, obvious, straightforward, just, simply, that's a flag that you know something you don't know you know and you're not doing a good job explaining it. Right, so not invented here is a sign of mental laziness. Great typing industriousness. But if you can take the challenge instead of understanding the existing software, you'll build a mental model of something with proven usefulness that you don't have to maintain or that you're about to maintain. And that's, that's much more valuable. Uh, this, is, this is why I like legacy development. Uh, because it's harder than Greenfield. It's like meteor. It's fun. Right. So one of the consequences of this, this downhill invention, uphill analysis, is the 10x developer. So in this example, 
the purple developer has been working on this system for a while and he understands it. He has a really good mental model of it, probably because he wrote it. Uh, but, you know, maybe he gets tired of it and he wants to move on to other things or uh, he needs more bandwidth. And so they're like, blue, green, go help purple with this project, probably part time even. And blue and green are coming in and they're trying to understand, they're trying to build up a mental model of the software so that they can change it. Meanwhile, it's quite easy. This, it, it doesn't seem like it would be, but I've seen this multiple times in my career. It's quite easy for Purple to be changing that software quickly because he's, he's got it in his head, so he's very efficient at, at changing it. And he's changing it so fast that blue and green cannot get a grasp of the mental model of it, no matter what they do, no matter how smart they are. And purple looks incredibly productive. And he's like, ah, oh, what's with these blue and green people? They're just getting in my way. They're just breaking stuff. They don't know what they're doing. They're stupid. No, purple, this is your fault. I don't want to be a 10X developer. This isn't, and this isn't purple being malevolent either. Purple's just trying to be productive. This is a problem of the system, and the way to fix it is for Purple to stop it, do not touch the code. Any change in that code happens pairing with blue or green or both, and blue or green is at the keyboard. Because that, that kind of shared work transfers a mental model and builds ideas together better than anything else. So then blue and green will actually catch up. This gets into the conflict between personal incentives and team level incentives. In the camarada and in science, this is expressed as the individual versus group interests. These are those priority problems. The fighting over who was first. Later, Perry and um, some other people argued over who invented the stile representativo. Like it freaking matters. There's a new idea in the world, people, good job. But this race to be first can get in the way, or in our case, the race to get the most tickets done. And this gets in the way because science, as we know it today, defines originality as a supreme value. We love to give Nobel Prizes to individuals, sometimes pairs. But it's bigger than that. Who worked in their lab? Who did they correspond with? There's a reason that there is a journal of the history of ideas, and it's because the history of ideas is never simple. It always involves lots of people. So what we want, a compromise, is we want recognition and esteem to accrue to those who have made original contributions to the common stock of knowledge. If you keep an idea to yourself, it might as well not exist. Give it to the people around you, let it grow. In this book about Joseph Priestley, it remarks that an I ideas are not conserved like energy. If you let it go, it doesn't get less useful to you. It gets more useful. The camarada invented the stile representativo, but opera went all kinds of places from there. This gets into one of my favorite words, generativity. I pulled this word out of the Journal of Organizational and Occupational Psychology. And I define it as the difference between my team's outcomes with me versus without me, as opposed to my personal productivity. How many JIRA tickets did I close? Because our work, it's not just about me. It's about at least the team and then the whole world. And the outcome of our work is not only our side effects. It's not only the software we produce that has a side effect on the rest of the world. It's also the next version of us. And it's the next version of our team because we are learning and growing together and we're learning and growing each other. So if I focus on generativity, then if I'm forced to have an annual performance review, it will include things like who did I help? What documentation did I write that was useful to someone else? What error messages did I add to the code that helped someone else get past that error? Because it's not just about me. 
It's about all of us. This implies, and there's a great book that explains this really well called Obliquity. It's a short book, also recommended. You would think that to be a great developer, you would want to be a better developer than the people around you. But you would be wrong, because if you do that, you are holding yourself back, because it's the people around you that build you up. To be a great developer, put the team first. Because if you can build a great team around you, then you will become great. It's counterintuitive, but it happens. And if you find yourself struggling to hire enough rock star great developers, that's because great developers aren't born. And they're not trained. They're certainly not self-trained. There's only so much we can get from videos on the internet. Great developers are semathesized. There is one other point that as I'm reading this paper on the Camerata, I came across something that just like shocked me and made me think about the world in a new way. And it led me to a conclusion that's kind of audacious. And I want, to, I want to hear what you think. It starts with the material on the surrounding culture. This is the late Renaissance in Florence. A lot is happening. There is innovation in the air. Ooh, interesting side note about the word innovation. In Joseph Priestley's time, the word innovation meant an idea or belief that was threatening to the existing system. It might disrupt the existing system, and that was a negative. So innovation had negative connotations. Of course, that's very different now. Innovation is, is, we think it's fantastic. We love change. Disruption even has positive connotations now. The language has certainly shifted. But the Camerata, they didn't pull opera out of nowhere. They were like midwives to a century pregnant with social and ideological and cultural ideas and practices from which opera emerged. One of these was the idea of systematic testing and measurement. So here we have like the beginnings of the scientific methods. Vincenzo Galilei used this. He was in the Camerata. And he's the first known person to like Systematically, he takes the strings and he stretches them out. He plucks them to make a note. And then he finds out how much shorter the string needs to be to get the same note at the next octave or to make a chord. And he, he found the ratios. I think it's like the squares um, of consecutive numbers. Uh, anyway, he methodically tested this and came up with this information. I bet that was useful to the camarada. But that was a new way of thinking in the Renaissance. And uh, in Joseph Priestley's time, he had some new tools. And um, it, they had empiricism by then, the idea that what we know comes through our senses and we can test our theories through deliberate experiments. He did tons of experiments. And he and Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson uh, were corresponded a lot. And they all were scientists and involved in politics because they had the passionate belief in optimism that they could apply rational thought to the world and change it for the better. And that was important. These days we have a new way of thinking too, thanks to the Batesons and the other cyberneticists bringing us systems thinking. We have new ways of applying rigorous thought to systems that aren't closed, that aren't determined by universal laws, think Newton's laws of motion. But now we can think and make predictions, statistically, about open systems with messy boundaries that are nowhere near equilibrium, also known as every system we actually live in. So we can think about these. One of the reasons we can think more about that is because we can do math that we couldn't do 50 or 100 years ago because we don't have to get everything down to a reducible equation because we have computers and they can do that work. So we're smarter than we used to be. And every discipline is new again. And whole new disciplines are emerging. The Camerata had the printing press that was relatively new. They had new ways of disseminating knowledge and that probably helped them learn about what the ancient Greeks were doing with words and music. 
We have the internet, of course. But it's not enough for knowledge to be accessible because a single person can't hold all the knowledge. We can only go so deep in so many fields. We need to relate different fields to each other in conversation. And that gets into another crucial factor for the camarada, that the very existence of such groups was new at the time. For poets and uh, musicians and, and painters and philosophers to get together in the salons of a nobleman was new. And the reason it was new is because they had just, in the Renaissance, in the last couple hundred years, they had just figured out that art, with a capital A, was a thing. And I'm like, whoa, there was a time when we didn't know art was a thing? And it's true, because like back in the Middle Ages, painting, they had painters, they had musicians, they had poets, but these were crafts. They were crafts alongside goldsmithing and bricklaying, and they had guilds just like those crafts. And if you wanted to be a painter, you got into the painting guild and you learned from another painter and you got into the painting guild because your dad was in the painting guild, not necessarily for any talent. And the nice thing about that was because, was that you could be sure that if you hired a painter from the painting guild, he would be competent and could depict a reasonable representation of whatever it is you asked him to paint. But as the guilds start losing power, you start getting uh, less, less guarantees. Not everyone has a computer science degree anymore. But more recognition of individualism and individual excellence. So you've got painters like uh, Michelangelo who, um, and sculptors who specialize in, in uh, people or in landscapes. And then you've got merchants have money now and so they can compete to hire these. Um, and, and you start, people recognize that there's this common thread that they couldn't name or define. I don't know if they had the word creativity then. That runs through painting and poetry and composition and playing music. And so art with a capital A was recognized and then they start forming academies and so to learn painting, you also learn about poetry and the great works and philosophy and some other things. And, and then you've got prestige, right? So, cause artists now have like this, this unnamed quality. And so they start getting welcomed into the salons. You get these cultured circles with the, like the camarada in the home of Giovanni de Bardi. So instead of painters hanging out with painters, Instead of Java developers separated from testers, separated from the people that operate the hardware, suddenly you realize that there's something more than the skill of painting and there's something we have to talk about. The Renaissance was about decompartmentalization, about mixing different fields and specialties and coming up with new thoughts out of the combination it's about emphasizing expressive qualities. What impact does this piece of art have on its viewers or its listeners? It's not about how many unit tests it has, what's its code coverage, and does it use these design patterns from a book? Software is not a craft. Okay? Programming is a skill. It is a necessary skill. Just like knowing how to paint is necessary to be a painter. But Java is like acrylic paint. Haskell is pottery. Ruby is watercolors. Bash is a song on a lute. We need to be able to do these things in order to create software. They are necessary, but they are not sufficient and they are not the point. The point is the impact we can have on the world interactively as it changes and we change and learn from it and it learns from us. I'm also not saying that software is an art. Software is not an art. When I look at a painting or I listen to an opera, I'm impacted. My inner world is changed by it, by my reaction to what this artist has depicted. 
but we do more than that in software. We change the physical world around us. When I pick up my phone and I touch the screen in a certain way, a car pulls up and takes me where I want to go. That's amazing. That did not happen 10 years ago. We are changing effectively physics. What happens when we make this motion is new. Now that's not all software. It takes more than software, but programming was an essential part of that. And programming is amazing because code, software, running software on a computer is a material unlike anything we've gotten to work with before as humans. It's more flexible than metal and, or plastic. You can almost design straight into it, almost. And then those feedback loops, we can learn so much faster, especially if it's a web app, because we can, and we can totally control deployment, so we can push it out, we can see what happens. We can work within the actual system, we can do experiments within this system that we can't predict the results of because they're not deterministic, but we can find out what happens when we tweak it. That is incredibly powerful. And it's something new. It's not something we can do alone. It's too complex than that. It takes a team of us. So software is not a craft and it's not an art. I'm saying that software is the next thing after art that we don't have a name for yet. The closest I can come is that ongoing software development is the practice of somathesy, of being part of a living system that is us and our code, our running software, that impacts the world of our user and they impact us. And that makes me a somathicist in the medium of software. And I really like this word and I like this slide, but I have one problem with it and that's that my name is on it. Because an idea does not belong to one person. To become real in the world, an idea takes a camarada and then a culture. So all of us are somathicists if we choose to think about it this way. And I am incredibly excited to be alive right now and in software, because software is the next thing after art and this age that we live in, this is the next thing after the Renaissance. We have whole new ways of thinking and new ways of using that thinking to make change in the world we live in and to change the world our children will live in. If we manage to get this right, they'll surrender by early night. The world will never That's my daughter Evelyn, who's 13, singing Hamilton, the modern music drama. May we, in our camaradas, have that kind of impact 400 years from now. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of goosebumps today. Um, thank you again, Jessica. Let's give her another round of applause.